To illustrate the use of task completion source, I've got a fairly simple program here that performs a mixture of I.O. and CPU-based work to process the contents of a file. The file is one month's worth of web server logs from my website. The month in question is from a few years ago for no better reason than it's a file I happen to have kicking around. As you can see, this is an ordinary IIS log showing the date and time of each request my web server handled, the incoming IP address on which the server handled it, the path of the URL being fetched, the IP of the client, the user agent string, and so on. As you can see, most of the requests came from RSS readers. That makes it quite hard to see how the rest of my site is being used. So I'd like a program to go through this file, finding only those entries representing requests to fetch specific articles from my blog. They're going to look like this. They begin with ENG blog, and then there are three numbers representing the year, month, and day on which I posted the article, and then a string identifying the particular article. It's fairly easy to write a regular expression that will match these entries and ignore the rest. And in fact, I've already written code to do that. This log processor class takes the path to a log file and works through it line by line, using this regular expression to match only the log entries I'm interested in. Having found the matching lines, there are various things I could do with them, but I'm just choosing to count how many times each different post was requested. This will let me find out which were the most popular posts. So the result of this processing will be to populate a dictionary where the key is the path for the blog entries URL, and the value is an integer showing how many times that article was read in the time span covered by the log file. I'm using a concurrent dictionary here rather than an ordinary one. I don't really need to because this code will in fact work one line at a time. I'm just using this because it happens to make this sort of item counting slightly easier than the ordinary dictionary, as we'll see shortly. As you can see, I'm using a stream reader, which has been the usual way to read the contents of a text file in .NET since version 1. However, I'm using a feature added in .NET 4.5. Instead of the usual read line method, I'm using read line async. This returns a task. Now, the point of this demo is to illustrate how to create our own tasks, but I happen to be consuming a task provided by the .NET framework in my implementation. And in practice, a lot of code that produces custom tasks will probably consume other tasks as well. I'm using a continuation here, so this class shows a mixture of thread based and threadless tasks. And again, that's pretty common. We tend to want to use threadless tasks to perform intrinsically threadless work, such as reading data from disk. And then when that work completes, we'll often want to hand over to a thread-based task to do some processing. And that's what will happen with this continuation. This means I'm only going to be using a thread when I've got some processing work to do. That continuation task we'll call this process line method. I check to see if the result of the task is null because that's how StreamReader tells us we've reached the end of the file. If it's not null, we've got a line to process. So I feed it into the regular expression object to see if it matches our pattern. If it does, I update the count for that blog entry in the dictionary. This add or update method is the reason I used a concurrent dictionary, by the way. It provides a succinct way of dealing with scenarios where you want to update an existing dictionary entry if there is one, and it creates a new entry if there isn't. This adds a value of 1 if we've not seen this blog entry before, and otherwise increments the value. The ordinary dictionary class doesn't have an add or update method, and would require a bit more code to handle a case where you see a particular key for the first time, which is why I've chosen to use the concurrent dictionary. There are some overheads involved from this being a dictionary designed to support concurrent access, but I don't really care about that for this particular demo. Once we've processed the item, I ask for the next line. The continuation returns, so it allows the thread to return to the pool, and we won't need a thread again until the next line comes out of the stream reader. When we get a null line, we know that we're done, and at that point, this code just prints out the results. Let me show you this in action. That runs through the 15,000 or so log entries, picking out the ones that correspond to blog entries, and then shows them in order of popularity. And apparently, the most popular articles that month were fairly old ones. So right now, 
I'm not actually creating any task objects. I'm using tasks supplied by the stream reader to read data out of this file, but the goal here is to show how to build my own task. Well, this class clearly needs to change, because it just prints the results of its work out to the console. Obviously, it would make a great deal more sense for this to provide the results programmatically, so that the code using the class can decide what to do with the results. Since this class does some potentially slow work, a task is the obvious abstraction. So I'll define a public property of type task of idictionary of string at int. Once we've finished populating that dictionary, we'll make it available as the result of the task this property returns. So I'm going to call this property blog hits task. I'll make it read only by implementing just a getter. So what will I return? Well, as I said earlier, the way to create a task that represents some asynchronous work is to create a task completion source. So I'll define a new field to hold that. Its type argument will be the same as the one I'm using for the task, an i dictionary of string and int. And I'll call that blog hits completion source, and I'll initialize that right here. My task getter can now return that completion source's task property. And now all I have to do is tell the completion source when the work is complete and provide the result. So in this else branch where we know the work is complete, we just call the completion source's set result method, passing in the completed dictionary. Now I can cut this code that prints the result out to the console and move that to where it belongs, which is in the code choosing to use this class. The decision of what to do with the process results belongs outside of the class that does the processing. So I'll paste the code in. This was relying on the dictionary field, but now that dictionary is available from the task. So let's grab the task object. I'll print a message saying that we're waiting for the work to complete. I'll call wait on the task and then print another message. Now I can just use the task's result property. I can also remove this hacky line of code here, which I was using to keep the process alive while the processor class ran before. Now I don't need that because this task object tells me when the work is done. So I'll run and it looks just like it did before, but now the client code knows exactly when the work is complete and is able to take charge of what to do with the result. By the way, this call to wait isn't necessary. Remember that the result property will block if you try to use it before the result is available. So if I comment these out and run again, it still works fine. This illustrates that the task completion source takes care of potentially awkward situations like this. If the client code tries to get the result before it's ready, it'll just block. Alternatively, if the client code decided to handle the results by hooking up a continuation, that would also work. In short, task completion source takes care of making our asynchronous task behave in exactly the same way as any other task.